in the next two modules we will be speaking of protein molecule interactions in the sense of looking at several other macromolecules and how they interact with proteins. The first three of these lectures will be on protein nucleic acid interactions, why we need to study them and what their importances are in terms of the mechanism and function of life processes. So if we look at this specific set, we will be looking at the basics of DNA RNA structure, the importance of protein nucleic acid interactions, the types of interactions, and what we mean by specific and non specific interactions. So, before we go into an understanding of what protein nucleic interactions are, we it was discovered late in the 19th century that there were microscopic observations of association of proteins with the DNA strands. If we look at these nucleic acids, we have ribonucleic acid, RNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA. There are many procedures now that are used to demonstrate that proteins do interact with DNA and RNA. And during the interaction, they influence the structure and the function of the corresponding nucleic acid that they are associated with. We will look briefly at the structures of DNA and RNA and see how they are important in the interaction with proteins. These are two types of nucleic acids. Both RNA and DNA are made from nucleotides. The nucleotides contain this five carbon sugar backbone, a phosphate group and a nitrogenous base. We will see what these mean in a moment. DNA provides the code for all cell activities and RNA converts that code into proteins to carry out cellular functions in our central dogma of biology from DNA to RNA to protein. When we look at the DNA and RNA structures, the nucleotides, as we saw, were composed of a nitrogenous base and five carbon sugar a pentose and a phosphate group. Now the nucleotides themselves combine with each other in what are called phosphodiester bonds to form polynucleotides in longer chains of the mononucleotide. The nitrogenous bases that are involved in the specific structures of DNA and RNA are of specific types. They can be they are generally organic molecules. They are organic molecules that are named because they have carbon and nitrogen. And they are bases because they have the presence of an amino group that could bind with and have the binding possibility of hydrogen bonding, which is extremely important. And association of the nucleic acid strands, as is known in DNA, is due to this hydrogen bonding. The nitrogenous bases that we have are the purines and the pyrimidines. The purines are adenine and guanine, and the pyrimidines are cytosine, thymine, and uracil. And thymine is specifically present in DNA, and uracil is present in RNA. So each of these nucleic acids have their own characteristic properties. They can be combined to form the polynucleotides in different fashions in the sense that they could interact in forming the specific polynucleotide chain through the phosphodiester bond. The two sugars that are involved here are the two prime deoxy D ribose and the D ribose present in RNA. So the recurring units of DNA contain this pentose sugar and those of RNA contain the ribose sugar. These are designated by this where this is where we have the difference in the sugar of the two nucleic acids. DNA has the two prime deoxy 
D ribose and this is D ribose for the RNA. In the formation of the nucleotide, we have therefore the sugar. We see that the OH is missing here. So this is a deoxy sugar. The oxygen is missing. We have the nitrogenous base attached here. And here is the phosphate group. These three components give us what is called a nucleotide. The nitrogenous bases, as we saw, could be the purines or the pyrimidines. And the sugars could be the deoxyribose or the deribose. The nitrogenous base and the sugar alone are called the nucleoside. When the phosphate is attached, it is called the nucleotide. The structure of DNA is unique in its double helical array where the sugar phosphate forms the backbone and the nitrogenous bases form specific hydrogen bonds between them. And these are complementary to our each other where the two strands actually run parallel in opposite directions. They are complementary to each other and they are held together through adenine thymine 2 hydrogen bonds and guanine cytosine 3 hydrogen bonds. So when we look at the structure of DNA, we find that the unequally spaced sugar phosphate backbone gives rise to two groups that have different width and depth. These are called the major group and the minor group. And because of the complementarity in the structure of smaller molecules or even with proteins, there will be different molecules that would be capable to bind to these different groups of the DNA structure. So the atoms that are present here are accessible not only to the solvent, but also to interactions with other molecules, including proteins. So with an understanding of what nucleic acids are in a very brief background, we understood that we had the sugar phosphate backbone and to it was attached the nitrogenous basis. Now, if we look at the importance of the protein nucleic acid interactions, they are extremely important for several fundamental biological processes. One is DNA replication and repair in transcription, RNA processing and translation, the binding affinities of several different transcription factors that are important determinants of gene expression, and the role in the regulation of the chromatin structure. So the protein nucleic acid interactions, as we can see, are extremely important to life processes and the types of interactions possible are important. If we look at the modes of interactions, the sugar phosphate backbone can interact with the proteins through electrostatic and stacking interactions. So we have electrostatic and stacking interactions possible because of the phosphate group here. The positive charge side chains of amino acid residues present on the protein can form hydrogen bonds and participate in these electrostatic interactions. And the negatively charged side chains of the amino acids, aspartic acid and glutamic acid can be involved in hydrogen bonds as well. If we look at the donor acceptor patterns of the base pairs in the major and the minor groups in this case, we have the specific orientation of the bases where we can have hydrogen bond donors and hydrogen bond acceptors in the formation of the three hydrogen bonds that are seen between these two specific nitrogenous bases, the cytosine and the guanine. This is important in the stability of the DNA molecule as well. When we look at the DNA donor acceptor base patterns for the minor group set, we will have an AT double bond formation and a hydrophobic methyl that is also present. The identification of DNA and RNA is done 
by absorbance studies as we had visited absorbance values and absorbance spectra of proteins we can look at their factor with dna this is where the bases of the dna and the rna absorb at a value of 260 nanometers and we know for proteins due to the presence of the aromatic amino acid residues this absorbance is at 280 nanometers however if we have a dna protein complex then we have an absorbance around 260 nanometers here the absorbance peak for both dna and rna is there for around 260 nanometers however depending on the composition and the environment the peak can shift and the ratio of the absorbance at 260 nanometers and 280 nanometers is the measure of a purity of the nucleic acid sample and a value near 2 indicates a pure nucleic acid sample this is often a way to identify the presence of the nucleic acids in methodologies that are used for the preparation or isolation of nucleic acids if we look at the protein side chain interactions that are involved we have the polar amino acids that can participate in hydrogen bonding depending upon their orientation in the protein the hydrophobic residues that can be involved in hydrophobic interactions the aromatic residues that are important here that can participate through stacking interactions and specific recognition through special motifs of the structures of the dna of the protein and the dna in their interactions that we will visit in the subsequent lectures the types of interactions that we see can be non specific in nature what we mean by non specific is the sequence of the nucleotides does not matter as far as the binding interactions are concerned so binding will occur irrespective of what sequence the nucleotides are in the histone protein dna interactions are an example of such interactions and they occur between the functional groups on the protein and the sugar phosphate backbone on dna we know that the sugar phosphate backbone of dna is negative so we would like to look at positive functional groups on the protein these are the specific amino acids however if we look at specific types of interactions between the nucleic acids and protein here the sequence of the nucleotides directly affects the interaction outcome and this is important to control transcription in prokaryotes and eukaryotes that are mediated by hydrogen bonding ionic interactions and van der waals forces so the interactions between the specific amino acids and specific sequence of nucleotides are important for the control for the control of transcription and other specific processes that are involved the specific interaction examples are for example the replication protein a r p a this is a major protein that specifically binds to single stranded dna in eukaryotic cells in vitro what happens is rpa rpa that is the replication protein a shows a much higher affinity for the single stranded dna compared to rna or double stranded dna so the association here is important for the replication process and there is a specific sequence that is recognized by the protein the replication protein a that binds to the specific sequence of a single stranded dna in the binding process during dna replication the recombination and dna repair what happens is the replication protein a will prevent the single stranded dna from winding back on itself in forming or forming other types of secondary structures so what this does is it helps in the dna replication process by binding specifically to single stranded dna 
in the event it prevents the single stranded dna from winding back on itself and forming other types of secondary structures other specific interaction examples include transcription factors and these are proteins that are going to regulate the transcription of genetic information from dna to messenger rna and this itself indicates the importance of the process because it is going to be the transcription process and specific interaction is required to bring about this so each transcription factor will bind to one specific set of dna sequences only and in the process it will activate or inhibit the transcription of genes that have these sequences near the promoters so the transcription factors will bind to a specific set of dna sequences only to bring about the biological process it is supposed to in its functionality the non specific interactions examples include the histones these proteins organize the dna into a compact structure that is called the chromatin these are the histones that have specific structural aspects the histone itself is an example of a non specific interactions and these are formed through the basic residues in the histones that make ionic bonds to the acidic sugar phosphate backbone of the dna and they are largely independent of the base sequence because they bind preferably to the sugar phosphate backbone the sugar phosphate backbone being negatively charged their protein interactions with specific amino acids are important the core histones are four proteins that are called referred to as h2a h2b h3 and h4 histones they have a high content of lysine and arginine as would be expected because they interact specifically with the sugar phosphate backbone of the dna which we know is negatively charged this high content of the positively charged amino acid residues allows them to closely associate with the negatively charged dna in non specific interaction types the octamer of the histone assembles when a tetramer containing two copies of both the h3 and the h4 forms complexes with two h2a and h2b dimers so we have an octamer assembly this protein is rich in positively charged amino acid residues and after the assembly of the tetramer they act as spools around which the dna winds as we can see the dna strands that are marked here winding behind the octamer that is formed now without the histones we realize that the unwound dna in chromosomes would be very long so the important role of the histones is to prevent dna from being tangled and protect it from dna damage if stretched out the dna of a human cell would be about 1.8 meters long but when wound about the histones this length is reduced to a, about 0.09 mm so we realize the importance of these specific interactions such as these histones that are largely populated with lysine and arginine residues up to 20 to 24% that give us an idea about how the positively charged residues on this histone protein are going to interact with the negatively charged sugar phosphate backbone of the dna so we realize that the importance of the protein and nucleic acid interactions 
They may be specific in nature, particularly when there is a transcription or a translation process involved that takes us from DNA to RNA to protein. These interactions or the biological processes that involve these proteins can be specific in nature, can be non-specific in nature, depending on the spe specific mechanism or the special mechanism that they are involved in. We now look at specific detection methods associated with protein nucleic acid complex formation. In the common detection methods that are used, there is the electrophoretic mobility shift assay, the MSA as it is called, the pull-down assays, and the DNAs or RNAs footprinting assay. In each of the three lectures that we have in this module part for protein nucleic acid interactions, we will be looking at one of the detection methods. In this lecture, we will be looking at the electrophoretic mobility shift assay with respect to DNA protein complex formation. So given that we have our DNA protein complex formed, we would now like to assess its presence and to see whether this protein nucleic acid complex has formed. This may be specific in nature or non-specific in nature. In this specific assay, we have the gel shift or the gel retardation assay as it is also called. We are monitoring the rate of DNA migration that is shifted or retarded upon protein binding. What essentially happens is a common affinity electrophoresis technique is used to study these protein DNA or protein RNA interactions. On complex formation, the free molecules, when subjected to the non-denaturing or the polyacrylamide agarose or gel electrophoresis, we realize that on complex formation, the migration is going to be much slower than the free molecules. So considering a regular gel electrophoresis experiment, a non-denaturing type in this case, whether it is a polyacrylamide or agarose gel electrophoresis, we will be able to monitor the migration of the bands of the free molecule and the complex. So we have our oligonucleotides, we have our cell lysate that contains our protein of interest. These are mixed together in our Eppendorf tube and Given the affinity for DNA for the specific protein, we will have a DNA protein complex formation. This DNA protein complex formation, as is shown here, is present in our Eppendorf tube along with free proteins and free DNA. The first lane that we see here, lane number one, is a DNA marker that gives us an idea of the specific molecular weights that we may observe. The second lane corresponds to DNA alone. And the third is our mixture. So we have number two here and number three here. This is our complex mixture that contains our DNA protein complex of interest. When this is now subjected to electrophoretic or electrophoresis, subjected to an electric field, we will have migration. This migration is going to occur based on the size of the complex formed. In this case, we will see that the retardation or the slower migration is because of the complex formation of the protein with DNA. The second band or the faster moving band that we observe here is due to DNA alone that corresponds with our DNA present here. So this is our DNA protein complex. This is our DNA. Another way that this may be even retarded further is the formation of an antibody protein DNA complex where this specific antibody that we have is for this protein of interest. 
So we have an even larger complex now due to the presence of the large antibody. And what is going to happen is the migration is going to be even slower and our band will appear even further away from this. So the migration that we see would depend upon the size of the molecules. Initially, the first band observed here is the uncomplexed DNA. The second band we observe here is the complexed DNA with the protein of interest. And the third band that we observe here is called the, is due to the antibody protein DNA complex. This is often called the super shift assay because we have now an antibody protein DNA complex which results in even further retardation, further slower migration of our protein DNA complex. What we have looked at in this lecture is the basics of DNA and RNA structures following from the sugar phosphate backbone then we looked at the specific purine and pyrimidine bases and how they form the DNA RNA structure. Our interest here is in the importance of protein nucleic acid interactions, considering our central dogma of biology from DNA to RNA to protein. An understanding of protein nucleic acid interactions is extremely important in understanding many processes. The types of interactions depend upon the specific amino acid residues involved. These may be hydrophobic type, small polar type that would be involved in hydrogen bonding, or an electrostatic interactions that are most common. These interactions can be specific in nature where the sequence of the DNA is important in the protein protein nucleic acid interaction process or they could be non-specific interactions and like we looked at the specific example of the positively charged histone proteins that interact with the negatively charged DNA. In the detection methods for this lecture, we looked at the electrophoretic mobility shift assay that gives us an idea of the formation of the complex of the protein nucleic acid in an identification method to determine whether the complex formation has taken place. These are the references. Thank you.